question and answer period after we um out at the end of our session tonight talking to our guests uh, I do want to make a couple of quick rep announcements. I um, want to let you know that our production of JQA has been extended through November 29th. It is a spectacular production written by Aaron Posner, directed by Sam Woodhouse, uh, film directed by Tim Powell, starring Crystal Lucas Perry, Larry Bates, Jesse Perez, and Rosina Reynolds. It is a apt, apt play for our current time in this political season. It'll make you laugh and think, so make sure you check it out. Head on over to sdrep.org to purchase tickets to view, again, extended through November 29th. And I also want to remind you that Amigos Del Reps uh, returns, Historias Tenebrosas returns with another annual celebration of Dia de los Muertos. It is an online play, Pay What You Can. It is a reading of The Displaced by Isaac Gomez. And I also want to remind you about our next two sessions of We Are Listening. We are going back to back this week. We took last week off to avoid the debates. Next Thursday, we'll be right back here at the same time featuring Kaya Dunn and Stephen Busher. That is going to be a spectacular conversation. And then on Thursday, November 19th, we'll be talking to Jasmine Sadler, who is a new board member here at San Diego Repertory Theater. And we'll also be talking to John Brooks, a board member from Moxie Theater. So make sure you come back and join us. Head on over to sdrep.org slash listening for more information and to sign up. Jacole, do you have any announcements you want to give the folks around the Hoya Playhouse way? Yeah, but I'm glad you just made that announcement because I was like, oh yeah, the 19th. I should put that on my calendar. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so that happened. Yes, we will be here. We will all be here Thursday the 19th for the to talk to some black board members in San Diego. Uh, going on at La Jolla Playhouse right now, we have the continuation of our digital wow series. Uh, right now featuring uh, episodes of Listen With The Lights Off, spooky stories that are coming to you from So Say We All and their Black Candies uh, book series. We also have episode four of Walks of Life presented by Blind Spot uh, Collective. This episode features uh, Walks of Black Life and it is stories about uh, black life, all black artists, all black uh, playwrights, the voices, the actors featured. And then we also have the full series of Society of Wonder and amazing puppet, uh, online digital puppet series by Animal Cracker Conspiracy. Lots going on over at La Jolla Playhouse, lajoyaplayhouse.org. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Jacole. Again, everybody, if you're just coming into the room again, please turn, make sure that your video is off and uh, make sure your microphone is off. And uh, we have a spectacular guest tonight, fresh off of a very, very successful festival that just took place this weekend. Uh, a lot of you might have heard about it. It was the uh, Breath Project and uh, close to 4,000 viewers this past weekend saw spectacular uh, eight minute and 40 second video plays and readings and uh we're just gonna head, go ahead and get into it please welcome to we are listening mr jamel chastin come on in man hello hey how you doing all right good good I, I was trying to i was trying to be ready for the cue so you know like that <laughs> <laughs> kind of entrance you know <laughs> hey well look well thank you uh thank you very much for joining us tonight man we really want to uh first i want to commend you on a spectacular festival and for the work that you put in uh to put this together especially in the light of the events that spurred it and the things that have happened this summer here in the u.s um to start off why don't you go ahead and give a little self-introduction to everybody listening and let us know how you um how you entered this performing arts theater space cool um well first i want to thank you guys for having me um this is totally an honor to be highlighted here um and yeah so i mean i've been in theater doing theater for about 25 years uh i came in i actually so originally from new york and i was in the spoken word scene like many of us were in the 90s and <laughs> and um a company, a friend of friends of mine had a company called Universes from the Bronx side. And um, I used to, we used to end up in the same venues all the time. And so they asked, asked me to join the company and then we dropped the Bronx side and it just became Universes. So I've been with Universes for the past 25 years, a founding member. Um, and that's kind of like my introduction into American theater, uh, other than, you know, as a child going to see plays that my mom took me to. Um, 
Yeah, and that that's pretty much my story. We've been doing a lot of, we started out doing a lot of colleges, um, universities around the countries, some some uh, international stuff. And then we did, um, then we started getting more regional, more regional uh, contracts and things like that. So yeah, and still, still currently working with them today. Uh, we just closed right before the pandemic hit. Uh, we had a show called Americus, which was kind of the precursor to a show we had in 2006 called Ameriville. Um, it was kind of looking at the last, say, four years of craziness that's been going on in the world. Um, and so, yeah, very all, all work is usually very political. And uh, we had just closed that in March. Uh, we went in to rehearsal in January, ran from February to March, and we literally got, I got home a week before the pandemic, like before the like, shutdown and everything. So I'm glad I made it back. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. I like Cincinnati, but I wanted to get home. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the purpose of this conversation is always is and it's, it's it evolves every week that we that we do this as it should you know um the purpose was for us to talk to black pro theater professionals artists administrators you know everybody and especially coming off the events of this summer number one with the covid lockdown and of course you know the everything that got spurred from not only ahmaud, ahmaud barberry being killed but of course what everybody saw with um George Floyd being killed. Um, before we get, you know, specifically into that, I always like to ask, like, what have, what, what, what has been your journey as far as being, um, you know, black African American man in this space, in this performing arts space? Like I said, like me and Jacoba are well aware with that, with that spoken word scene coming out of the '90s. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> give us a little bit of your, you know, how how your journey has informed you as far as race and equity is concerned. Mm. You know, it's interesting because I feel like. Part of our, if, if, if universes has a, a mission, I think it would be, we've always kind of spoken that we, we're the voice to those in our community don't, who, who don't have that voice, you know? So we feel a responsibility to, you know, to represent to a certain degree. Uh, and that doesn't mean represent the whole black race, but just represent our communities and where we come from, you know? And as we have grown up in this industry, uh, I think our community has grown so in terms of where before it might have been the Bronx, you know, and in, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan and very specific when we talked about community, I think that community has definitely grown now. And as an African-American uh, uh, in, in American theater, I mean, for me, like I have friends who are poets and playwrights and, you know, whatever, and I don't have anything against art for art's sake, right? But I feel like as an African-American writer, an actor, I don't have the the luxury to just write about, you know, flowers on top of hilltops and, you know, beautiful landscapes and things like that. I, I need to be talking about, and I need to be uh, bringing attention to matters that need to be addressed and matters that affect the community I come from and sharing that information with those who aren't from that community so they can just be a little more enlightened about others' experience. Um, and I, I often say, like, people ask me about my work, and I say, well, my work is largely political. Um, and there's been points in my career where I felt like I wish I didn't have to write about race and inequity, mm -hmm. right? I really wish I could talk about something else. It seems like every time I try to steer away from that, something happens where I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta deal with this, right? And so, I mean, I, you know, as I'm saying this, I'm like, wow, why do I ha why do I feel the responsibility to have to do that, right? But again, I think as artists of color, um, black and brown artists, I, I, again, I feel like our stories, first of all, aren't being told in other, you know, uh, in, in any other way. So we definitely, if, if we want our stories told, we must tell them, right? Mm -hmm. But then also, again, just like, I, I cannot get up on a stage for two hours and not, talk about especially since you know again like the quote unquote the work we've done has been called devised theater right so if we're creating work from the ground up then i definitely have a responsibility to talk about some real stuff right and so that's kind of been my experience like just i don't i don't feel black and brown artists have the freedom to get at it the way white artists do hmm. it's just, yeah. 
Well, and this is going to start to segue us into talking about the Breath Project, because I definitely want to hear about the creation of it and, and the execution and from how it went from your standpoint. Um, but you, you said, uh, you know, that the political theater has always kind of been something that you've done that's always been in your DNA as an artist. Um, and when you try to veer away from that, there's something that happens. It's like, nah, now I gotta, now I gotta respond to this. Do you feel like your work is in general in response to something um, versus in whether it's internal, external, what, you know, it, yeah. Do you feel like your work is generally responsive or has to be responsive? That's a great question. And no, because I feel like um, oftentimes, like this is one of the rare occasions where I actually was writing work, like in like directly responding to something in the moment. Oftentimes I need space and distance from an event. Mm. Like, so again, we wrote our show about Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina happened, I think in 2006 or 2004. Yeah, I think it was 2004. We didn't write, we didn't write the piece until 2006. So again, for me, that, that worked just fine because I needed distance and time. And obviously we had to talk to people and things like that. So um, oftentimes it's just coming from my experience, you know, uh, whether it's present or something that's happened in the past that, that shows relevance to our present. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's the unfortunate part about, I think, in terms of writing political work is when you look back and you go, man, I wrote this five years ago. I could have wrote this. Yes. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like and, you know, whenever you're telling human stories, there are those connect connective tissue that just make it a human story, regardless of what the topic is. But if it's written well, but but yeah, I, I feel like it's less in response to an actual event and more in response to just my experience walking in the skin. Mm -hmm. Now the breath project obviously is in very direct response. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about why you felt, why this felt like it needed such a direct, such a profound response? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go back a little bit, back to the nineties again. <laughs> um, it's one of my favorite places. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good hip hop, you know. <laughs> um, but in the nineties, I was doing a lot of living in New York. I was doing a lot of political rallies. Again, the work that we were doing as a company was, we were being called, you know, when Amadou Diallo uh, mm. uh, got murdered, we, we were one of the companies that were part of that um, response, you know, in New York and going to rallies and things like that. When, um, so, so we, you know, Anthony Baez, it just goes back. Like you know, we, we, we met his mo mother and we, you know, she became a political act activist after Anthony Baez was murdered by police in New York. And we, we've been in similar circles with her at times as well. So, um, but with, with the breath project, I couldn't do those things, right? Like shoot forward 25 years and I'm like, I have a six year old son who has um, autoimmune issues. So I couldn't be out marching. I had to keep my circles mm -hmm. really small. And I was frustrated by that. I wanted to be out there, but I, I just couldn't um, or chose not to for those reasons. And so for me, it was like the question that me and Marika Gabori, Marika Gabori is uh, the, the other co-founder of the Breath Project. We were just basically asking ourselves, what can we do? You know, it was a response to kind of like that personal question, like what, what role can I play? Uh, and then it just organically started to happen. Marika had asked me to write a eight minute and 46 second monologue. And I actually resisted at first. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to, like I had been writing, like I wrote about Ahmaud Arbery, like maybe a few weeks before, you know what I'm saying? And I was just like, I, no, I don't know if I want to go there right now. Um, and then, I did write the piece and then we were like, okay, let's, let's, this, this is a strong piece. Let's see what we're going to do with it. So we recorded it and then it just started to organically take shape from there. After the recording, um, we decided to see if there were any online festivals or some, what, you know, submit it. What are we going to do with it now kind of thing. And then the next day I went back to her and I said, why don't we just do our own virtual festival? Um, you know, no brick and mortar is not, a thing right now, right? Uh, everyone's kind of in the same situation. So in terms of a virtual theater festival, and we can do it just as well as anyone else could. Um, 
which I had no idea what that really meant, <laughs> like the undertaking, right? And so then from there, we had conversations. I reached out to Cincinnati Playhouse. Uh, she reached out to Southern Rep where we had relationships. And then from there, we just kind of saw what, what the project could be, you know, what the initiative could be. And so it, we definitely wanted to, the, the goal initially off the bat was like, BIPOC artists need to be recognized and have a space where their where their where their work uh, can be heard and 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 viewed, uh, and then also because of our experience with the, you know, being in American theater, we also knew about the inequities and felt like we need to take the fight there. So my thinking was, no matter what arena you come from, whether it's the business world or service industry or whatever, in this moment in time, we have an opportunity, and we needed to respond to that and take advantage of this opportunity to try to make a change. So for me, that opportunity was in American theater. Like people were listening, people were responsive. It was like, okay, how can I help? What can I do kind of thing? So it's like, okay, I've heard these conversations for the past 25 years and how everyone wants to diversify their programs, how you want to diversify your, you know, your, 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 your staff or whatever. Now's the time to step up and, and, and let's do that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You say you want to do it, the window's open, let's jump through it together. And so that's my position. It's like we can work in partnership to try to actually make some some significant change. Mm -hmm. You're on mute, Ahmed. Of course I am. Um, uh, so when you decide to go ahead and push forward and we're going to do this, uh, was there was there any obstacles? Were there any type of voices? you know, saying to you at the time, you know, internally, externally, you're like, nah, maybe you shouldn't do this. Maybe the same time to do this, let's just not do it. You know what? That, yeah, that's another great question. And I, I um, had it been another time and had it been a thought I had on my own, I probably wouldn't have acted. And it was great to have someone in constant, be in concert with someone who was thinking the same way you were, right? And then like to, say, okay, let's, let's take this next step. And it was almost like, like before we knew it, the thing was moving on its own. And so the obstacle definitely, I, I definitely have my own internal, like, what are you trying to pull off here? Like, what are you, mm -hmm. who are you to try to do this, right? And um, so I definitely have those moments. I don't think in terms of the response we got from when we, re when we were reaching out to theaters, the response was great. I mean, majority of the people jumped on board uh, and if they, even if they didn't jump on board, they, they, they seem as though they believed in the mission, right? Mm -hmm. So that was great. So we didn't have, we haven't yet had that kind of struggle, but I'm sure that will come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it'll be somewhere in that room. How did you, uh, how did you, and what made you go with the name The Breath Project? As an artist, I, I, I'm, I'm really quick to, respond to the first thing, not the first thing that jumps into my head, but the first thing that sounds good that jumps into my head. <laughs> um, and that was that was really organic. It just kind of came and I was like, you know, it wasn't like I sat down with a bunch of names around. I'm like, I just was like, what are we gonna call this thing? Thought about it for a minute. And I was like, the breath project, you know? Um, and it felt good, it sounded good. It made sense in terms of what we were trying to accomplish. So yeah. Um, it just, would, do you mind expanding on that a little bit? Like, I think that the three of us here understand 100% okay. why, yeah. why, why you called it the breath project. But so, so again, it, it was, yes, it was definitely in response to, again, George Floyd was a catalyst, the murder of George Floyd, the, the unfortunate monstrous murder of George Floyd was the catalyst for many things I think that happened around the, around the world, not just in the United States, because I know of other projects like this that happened in the UK as well. So it was a definite response to that, it, coupled with everything else, like you said, that had happened before, right? And then, and then just digging into your own personal bag of, of, of um, uh, abuse, you know, abuse and, and all that, right? And so, so it made sense because George Floyd talked about, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, right? Um, the whole, it seemed like the whole country, the whole world took a collective, like what the heck mm. are we looking at? 
right? So for me, the whole idea of breathing and gaining breath and losing breath. And when I wrote the monologue, um, I, what I was trying to do was in that eight minute and 46 seconds, I was trying to um, do a piece that resembled someone holding their breath for their life, right? Like holding their mm -hmm. breath, like as black people in America, we cannot push back on every little thing that happens to us, right? Because we'd be going crazy, right? It just, <laughs> like, I'd be pushing back all day, every day, right? Right. We can't do that. So we, we, pick, we pick and choose our fights. And I felt like, although I may have written many, like I've written plays and monologues and things around this topic, I felt for the first time I was really exhaling, mm -hmm. right? Because I was just sick and tired. I mean, I was, I was telling someone, I, I met with, um, Ron McCants, who, who runs, a, a, he runs a similar project uh, for film, um, film and TV. And I, I met with him today on the phone and, and that was amazing, doing some amazing work. Um, and I was telling him about when I was sitting on my couch and this was like, at some point I was, I was just on my couch and I don't know, I think I, maybe I had watched some news or something. And I just started bawling, like out of nowhere, I was just like, bawling like and I'm like asking myself like what is wrong with me what is wrong and I realized I was traumatized it was trauma it was years of trauma that was coming out and so and I think that's hard for maybe it's not hard because if you know whether you're a holocaust survivor or a family of a holocaust you know survivor or, or something like that maybe you can understand the feeling of trauma being released Mm -hmm. over a period of time but I know for I know for black and brown folk it's a real thing um I'm sure it's real for everybody but for us it, it it's wrapped around our the color of our skin it's it's funny that you say that because um <clears throat> I had a meeting today you know in this space that we're in talking about these things and you know I had to express that you know this doesn't this doesn't turn off at the end of the day it doesn't turn off when the meeting's over. It doesn't turn off when the equity and inclusion and diversity conversations turn off. You know, I, I turn on the TV, I'm seeing it there. I turn on sports, I'm seeing it there. I'm talking, looking at radio, podcasting. You know, this, this conversation is just, it's constant. It's when you wake up, it's when you go to sleep, it's constant. And it's like you're saying that trauma, um, you know, my Axel Foley, Beverly Hills Cop 2 line, like, you know, I haven't always been an angel. I, I, I fractured a law or two when I was younger. <laughs> um, but those have been my most, that was like my most peaceful running with the police mm. as from being, you know, a, a, a tall black child, you know what I mean? All the way up through high school and into now, like I've had those run-ins that had, that were adverse simply because of what I was, there was, there was no, there was no other reason. No other reason. There was no other factor as to why it was a bad encounter. There was nothing going on. There was no laws being broken. There was no nothing. It was just that. Then it's always that fear of it going south. And a couple of times it almost did go that far south. You know what I mean? So that, that trauma is real. I know Jacole can speak to that. That trauma is, is real. And like, it, it does show itself in many different ways. Sometimes it's tears. Sometimes you just mad throughout the day and don't yeah. know why you just mad and nobody can catch a break from you. Cause it's just hit <laughs> you that day. And it's just, you just, you running on it. Um, and so I can imagine what was the response? Like when it got time to deal with submissions, like how, how, how was the response when people were submitting or beginning to submit to the project? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm over here messing with my light. I'm just trying to get up. <laughs> you know, you got me realizing, oh, shoot, I'm meant to turn on my little ring light. I'm supposed to be light enhanced, too. It's to I, I had the natural light behind me, but it's starting to get dark now. So I'm like, oh, no, it's not working. I'm going to enhance my light. Okay, there, that's still good. Um, what was it like when submission started coming in? Uh, the submission process was, well, at first, at first, we were getting things that weren't meeting the criteria, mm. uh, because again, like the, the criteria was was there weren't a lot of criteria, but they were really important to us, and that they be from artists of color, and that um, 
it'd be eight minutes and 46 seconds long, right? And we had a little bit of freedom with that. It was like, okay, it can be eight minutes and 46 seconds long and then you can have credits afterwards or you can do 840 and have credits go up to 846, right? But it needs to, you know, that, that was the, the most uh, leeway we gave. So at first it was like, man, like, we started questioning, do we need to rethink this? You know, is the- well, And the, the with, where people weren't meeting the criteria, was that in length or and you yeah, weren't yeah, getting uh, POCs? Yeah, with the time. It was, yeah, it was mainly okay. time. It was just like, so then you start, I mean, myself, I definitely started questioning, second guessing, was that a good, was that a good decision, right? Mm. Um, the other part about the 846 that I was internally conflicted with uh, was, I wanted to make always make sure that I wasn't exploiting this, right? Like I, I do not want to be using this as an exploit in any exploitive way. So that was just a constant struggle within myself. Um, but we started, we got a little nervous with the submissions. Like we definitely had a goal in mind. I think we were thinking like, wow, if we get like maybe 200 submissions from around the country, because we had 24 theater partners, right? So we're like, well, if everyone, if all our theater partners had like five submissions, that would bring us, you know, we'd have at least a hundred, you know, somewhere in their ballpark. Um, and for a while we were like in the low twenties and I was like, well, I guess this is what it's going to be. <laughs> and then I had to think about myself as an artist and I'll wait for the last minute, right? <laughs> so. So most of the submissions we got were like in that last week, you know, and I think to date we got like little, we had like 95 submissions uh, and th today we still receiving some. So we have like 98 mm. submissions right now um, that, that live in the archive. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. What was the um, selection process like? Oh, I'm sorry, Nicole, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, please, no, please. So selection, what we did was we had, again, one of the, so, we had a few asks when we reached out to the theaters. Um, one was that they just commit some kind of resources to the artists, right? Whether it was like, if someone needed space, if they had this access to their space, then let, you know, let the artist use your stage. If you had access to a video camera, professional video camera, maybe that's something, you know, whatever the, those resources might be that the artists might need, some type of support or whatever, we wanted them to offer that. We wanted them to bring on a BIPOC curator, somebody, a curator of color so that they can curate the work and then also commit to some kind of live production down the road. Um, so that was, that was, that was what we were asking for. And then uh, what was, I'm sorry, I mean, what was the other question? It was just like what the selection process was like. Yeah. So then the curators, so we had a really easy selection process and we would try to keep it simple. Um, we had numbers from one to three and it was, it wasn't about competing. Like we didn't want them to judge it against the last thing they saw. It was just like, just look at it for the content and, and how it makes you feel, you know, mm -hmm. how you feel about, so give it a one, two or three. Um, and that was pretty much it. And I think each curator, I don't even know how many submissions they got. Herbert, who Herbert Seguenza, who's actually on here, he was mm -hmm. one of our curators. And um, so I, I, I didn't have a whole lot to do with the curation process, honestly. Um, Marika was more in control of that, but yeah. And then once once we got those submissions in, we we in order to separate which ones are going to make it to the festival. Obviously, the high the quote unquote highest scores got picked for the festival. Uh, but again, it was really important to me and, and to Marika that with those twenty four selections, we still have a good forty that are in the archive that no one got to see necessarily right so we want to find ways to continue to promote those works as well so that's something else we're, we're looking to do uh probably next week we're going to start airing like one each week of of some of the ones that weren't in the festival you talked a little earlier about uh trauma mm -hmm. and and kind of realizing our trauma and acknowledging our trauma but we as artists we put our trauma into our work, especially as, I mean, as a spoken word artist, I same say, like I was doing spoken word before, that's what they called it, you know? Right. I was, you know, in the 90s, it was just like, I think I'm just writing like angsty poetry and <laughs> but it needs to be said out loud and other people try to read it. And I'm like, no, that's not how it goes. Let me tell you how it goes, you know? And yeah, then rhythm. I started hearing, the, exactly. No, that, that's not the rhythm. That's not the flow. Let me, let me just do it. I'll just do it. <laughs> um, and so that's how I discovered spoken word because it was just something that flew out of me. 
mm-hmm. but what was going into it was at the time 100% my 16 year old angsty trauma. Everything that I was feeling is what got put down on the page. And I feel like that's what we as artists do, especially you as um, as a spoken word artist, as now like as a, with this monologue project and with these solo shows that we do, it's, it's all trauma. It's literally mm-hmm. putting your trauma on paper and then choosing to perform it yeah. for people. Um, but I feel like this is a different level of trauma that we're all feeling right now. Mm-hmm. And, and, and because we're all used to feeling the trauma and knowing how to express it, but this is a different level of trauma. What's the difference? Like in, in, in create, like again, creating work, like you said, I get to do this two years, I get to do this in response, but this is so immediate and it's so different and it's so visceral um what how how was creating your piece for this project different or was it i guess i should say was it different when you said the other words that you mean the monologue that i wrote yeah mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. i don't think that that it was definitely necessarily different. It, it was different in the sense that I was responding immediately to something. Sure. And that was very different for me. Like I said, like I, I, I often have hard time writing about something in the moment. Um, and so that that was different for me. But I think what I what I did in that I wasn't I wasn't telling George Floyd's story. I was telling my I was largely right. telling my own story in that monologue, right. um, you know, colored with some other nuances, but for the most part, I was coming from my own experience and using that to connect to what what I had just witnessed. Um, I think in terms of the breath project itself, or just this moment in time that we're kind of like this window that that we saw open when everyone took to the streets and people were marching side by side, black, white, and brown, right? And young and old, right? Like, I think we all were like, oh my God, this is the first time I've seen it like this. Right. And so, again, there's that window that was open. I think the difference for me is the immediacy. Uh, And when I say the immediacy, I mean how we don't have a lot of time to make this change. I feel like windows close very quickly. And if we're not careful, right, and if we're not vigilant, then the window will close and we'll find ourselves back where we were before, right? Because let's be honest, when it comes to Again, my fight is going in American theater. When it comes to American theater, or just it's a business, right? You Mm -hmm. have a you have a big playhouse. You got to pay staff. You got to pay, you know, your 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 lights and all that stuff, and um, and you got to, you know, put people in in seats. And so when it comes down to it, the bottom line is, you know, the, the analogy I've been using lately is, you know, maybe not this year, but if we look at, you know, every Christmas season, we know, you know, um. We, we, we know what plays we're going to see at, 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 a, at a, you know, um, mm-hmm. Christmas story, right? We're going to see Christmas story somewhere. Mm-hmm. They're not canceling Christmas story for some black show, right? Or some black and brown show. <laughs> They're not canceling that, right? So, because they know the month that's going to make money, right? And people are going to come see that. It's a family show. So, again, for me, it's, 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 I feel like such an urgency, like, oh, why is this pandemic still happening? We need to get, <laughs> we need to make change now. And, and so I feel like for me, that's the difference in whatever work I'm doing now is there's a, there's a, there's a true immediacy and urgency that is present that, that I think we're all trying to respond to in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Right. I also wonder, and you, you started to touch on it, but why is why now the immediacy? Why this one? George Floyd wasn't the first black man to get yeah. killed on on camera and then have it get posted on social media. Amar Arbery wasn't the first one to get. Good God, that actually was a pretty unique story. But I'm sure that mm-hmm. wasn't the first time that shit has happened. Right. You know, for years, I've, I've for as long as I've been in San Diego, there's been at least one a year. Why? Yeah, yeah. What's different now? Why right now? I mean, because why the reckoning? Well, Again, yeah, I feel like the collective response is is why right now, right? I feel like like we go back to Rodney King when we when we saw that tape, Rodney King getting his ass. Well, can I curse? 
Is it? Yep. You can. <laughs> I've been holding back. <laughs> <laughs> me too, Jamal. Me too. <laughs> oh, you just gave me license. No, I'll, 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 I'll be here. I'll be here. But when we watch Rodney King getting his ass whooped, right, by those cops, but us as black folk, we weren't as shocked. We saw that, all, like, we know that, yeah, that happens all the time. I think a lot of the rest of America was like, oh my God, I can't believe what I'm seeing. But again, what happened? Window closed, moved on. You know, there was there was a riot in LA and beyond that, like, you know, we just continue to move on. Um, I, again, I think now there's a real collective, like, inhale that happened, uh, like, oh my God, I can't believe. And, and I feel like it wasn't just that it was witnessed, action, people took action. And, and, and I know that marching is not enough, right? It's just, that's the begin point, right? Marching and the, and, the, and the stuff you see in the streets, that's the begin point. But I do feel like that is the first time I remember seeing it like that. Yeah, yeah, white people were marching with us in the 60s, but not to that degree, mm -hmm. you know? The, 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 I just felt like the collective response this time was much more, um, it was stronger and much more visual and much more impactful. I think probably to add on to that too was this time in which, this time it was the malice in how it happened, mm -hmm. you know, we literally, by virtue of your project, it was literally eight minutes of this happening while the man doing it was literally staring into the camera, daring you to be upset about it. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of, we've seen brothers get shot. We've seen them get beat. We've seen them get choked out for a minute. Like we, we've seen that, but to have someone just sitting there and to have to sit there for eight minutes and yeah. literally watch a man die while the person who was killing them was basically just, yes, you're watching me do this. Yeah, you're right. you know it was I'm, almost nine minutes. Yeah, and, eight I, know, minutes and, 46 and seconds. I know I'm gonna get away with it. It yeah. was basically that, that I think just really set, you know, the fuse. And on top of that, there's COVID and on top of that people are out of work and there's this and it was just it was just a perfect mixture for it to set off like it did. You're exactly right on that. Yeah that that guy was like he was like if, if you believe in the devil there it was. I mean it was just like I mean he was just evil. That was just evil. Um and it was clear like you say looking right into the camera and all that. And another point you're exactly right on I think we because we were all locked down and we had less to distract us mm -hmm. away from what was happening, then that, like you said, was a, almost like a perfect storm in terms of getting getting the masses riled up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it, Do you remember folks that, uh, sorry, just real, real no. quick, Ahmed. Yeah, go for uh, it. For folks that weren't able to see the festival this weekend, is, is, is that, can this still be seen? Can people still view the Breath Project? Yes, yes. If you go to the breathproject2020.com, uh, I could put that in the chat as well. If that helps. Uh, the, Breath Project, the Breath Project 2020.com. Um, there'll be a link to all the shows. That so we have all three. There's four. I think four and a half hours total, like or, or something like that. Um, yep. And so that'll be up. And, and and also, the archive is ongoing. So if you ever go, you know, want to go to the archive, thank you for putting that up. <laughs> yep, yep, for sure. If you want to go to the archive and look at anything that wasn't in the festival, that's available to see as well. Um, yeah, you know, we're really excited about the fact that this will still be viewable. Let's that's talk about the festival itself. Let's talk about the weekend. Let's, yeah, let's yeah, talk yeah. about how you were feeling and how oh. it went and how it went down. Okay, I'm going to keep it 100. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you saw me adjust my chair, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the festival was amazing. All right, and this like, again, it, it's like one of those things where, you, like, I can't believe it actually, we actually made it happen, like it, it came together. And I, I am not confused about, it was me and Marika. It was me and Marika and all those partners and all the curators who came on to help us out uh, that made it happen. And so we're trying to do this through partnerships. So that's, that's first and foremost. Um, it was stressful, um, but it wasn't like the hardest part. So 
I think I mentioned earlier, bro, we on demand sponsored it. And we had some tech issues, right? Um, and that was like really, I, I had to do everything I could to not show that, that frustration and stuff, because it was like, we have two days to pull this off. I need to stay focused. I can't be worried about what just happened. Like that just happened, so that's over, right? So we had the first, the first day we went up and the computer crashed. The, the guy who was running tech, his computer crashed. Oh, no. So a lot of people couldn't get in initially. Um, and then we, you know, we re rebooted, and then we had to send out the link again. And then, and then we found out the next day that in order to view it on Broadway and demand, you had to have a free account. I don't mm. know who that information was given to, but it wasn't given to me. And so, um, so that became an issue too. So the second day we had to kind of backtrack, send out this another email to people to let them know that they had to sign up for a free account. So again, the fact that we got 3,700 viewing I'm, is amazing because I know we lost some people to that. But again, what we did do, Marika is amazing. She sent out, we, we got a lot of emails from people saying, hey, I can't get the link on this side and the other. Marika responded to all of those and I'm, Today, I believe she sent them the link to all the videos, you know, all the stuff that, that we recorded over the weekend. So people still will get to see it. Uh, the money that we uh, uh, got donated, that money is all going to the artists and the curators. Um, so we're super excited about that. This was not a, uh, this was not a, uh, a profit making venture by any means. Uh, this was a, definitely a, a passion project and something that I continue to keep working with and working on. Uh, again, our next steps is, so the few things that we're looking at, we're definitely looking at uh, acquiring funding to do a, a, a national rollout production. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at hopefully about 10 pieces that we can pick from the festival to, to work with some our partners to, to premiere some of this work. Um, but before we get to that point, I'm looking to put together a, na a national uh, town hall meeting with BIPOC theater artists so that we can talk about, because as a BIPOC artist, I can assume I know what the want, wants and needs are, but you know, mm. I shouldn't do that, right? <laughs> so, so we wanna actually have conversations with uh, artists and theaters you know, um, around the country to figure out what exactly are those next steps and what do they look like? Mm -hmm. There was a question that came up today, actually. Um, it was posed on Facebook by somebody who is here today. Uh, is there a thirst for political theater right now? We are, and political theater is something that you've been doing, it sounds like, from way, way back. And we're in this period of civil unrest. We are in this period of COVID. And there, there's the, the theory that people don't want that in their entertainment right now. I even had a friend complaining on Facebook because This Is Us was way to this the, this week's episode of This Is Us. They they were wearing COVID, they were dealing with COVID and I don't want that. And, and they were dealing with George Floyd. I don't want that in my, this is a, like, but this is what we're dealing with. So there's a question right now, is there a want, is there a thirst for political theater or are people just uh, wanting to just be entertained in their entertainment? Uh, as somebody who produces political theater. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> let me top dance for I'm you. I'm to get real good right now. Okay, so let me answer this. Um, uh, is there a thirst for political theater? I hope so. Um, I understand the, the exhaustion of, you know, TV commercials that talk about, you know, uh, politically politically uh, motivated, the, the understand the uh, exhaustion behind the, the election cycle, all that stuff. I understand the exhaustion about turning on the news and seeing people in the street riding, I get it. But you know what, this is the world we live in. And so you can escape for a minute, but you're gonna have to come back sooner or later, all right? You cannot escape reality. And the reality is that this is happening to people on a daily basis. So I understand the need for entertainment, trust me. I mean, I, you know, poet, singer, writer, you know, like that's what I do. But I'll say this, I feel like there should always be a thirst for political theater that is smart, right? 
Now, now, now that becomes tricky, right? Because my, my interpretation of what's smart and what's well written and all that stuff is my own, right? But that's my opinion. I feel like you can, you can write about topics in such a way that are, that are just intelligent and, and crafty and, and entertaining and insightful and all those things can come from a well-written piece, you know? Um, so my short answer is yes, <laughs> I hope so. Um, but I think there needs to be balance, the bottom line, right? We wanna get back to, a, we wanna get to a world where there's some balance. And that's what we as black and brown artists are fighting for, balance in our industry. There is no balance, right? If, if, if the gentleman I was just talking to today, Ron McCants, um, he was talking, he made a great point. He's like, there's black folk are 13 point something percent of the United States. Mm -hmm. So in the industry he's talking about film and film and TV, there should be at least 13 percent of those those things represented on film and screen. I feel the same way about theater. You know, we need a balanced representation for black and brown artists. You know, um, our stories are valid and our points are uh, points of view are slightly different, and those things need to be heard and shared. You know, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'd, I'd love to talk to this person a little bit more about that, but my short answer is yes. It's just got to be done well. Yeah, because if if we're looking across the board at theater, and if <clears throat> if a majority of the leadership is white, a majority of the board is white, and a majority of the administration is white, you're not going to be balanced on stage. It's not going to happen like that because the concerns, the concerns and the representation if they're not trickling down for if they're not trickling down from the top and recognize at the top there's no way they're going to filter down to the stage there's no way they're going to filter down to what is outputted and therefore if nobody on the board is hanging out with people of color how does that organization think it's going to put anything on stage that mm -hmm. that accurately accurately not mm -hmm. just represents accurately represents people of color like if you're not if you're not associating, then how do you know what you're really putting on stage? How do you know what to even look for? How do you know what even is real? How do yeah. you even know what represents? And how do you know even where to spend the money and who to ask to come to the theater and who to get to ask? If you don't know how, how do you even know who to ask to come help you get people in the theater and put something on stage? Right. Yeah, Herbert, that article? Uh, Herbert, oh, sorry, go ahead. Herbert has something in the chat. He said, donors dictate the, um, the season. And that's very true. I mean, again, like, you know, yeah, everything you're saying is dead on, dead on. Jaco, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I was, I was just gonna, I was referencing um, an article that was in the LA Times last week, I think maybe it was the week before, but it was uh, 40 playwrights giving testimonies of experiences that they have had working in white theaters and how many, just to what Ahmed was talking about as far as if you, you don't know the people, how do you know it's authentic representation? because so many of these stories were people were were white theater makers white gatekeepers telling black playwrights that their stories weren't the right kind of black or weren't black enough or they weren't actually telling black stories and how can we do that and let's make sure that we black up this character or you know talking to local playwrights and she uh very well known, very respected woman in this community talking about being in a, a writer's room. And one of her characters was just a wonderfully, wonderful black woman. And the insistent that this character needed to be angry. You know what's missing? She <laughs> needs to be angry and she needs to be bitter and she needs to really express that in everything she does. And, but that, this is what black playwrights are being told about how to write their characters authentically because people don't know the authentic experience. Yeah. And, the and people not, who are reading these plays, yeah, please go and ahead. And it's not monolithic, right? Like, like the black experience is vast like any other person's experience. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, what, even if you're coming from the same community, you know, like, so yeah, it's, I think largely, and this is part of what I wanna try to work on in our partnerships is talking about audience education. And what I mean by that is like, and like what you were saying, like if you don't talk to black people or have black people around you or have black people in your staff, then how could you possibly know how to 
have those relationships and what that, you know, how to, how to move forward with that. And I just think that people need to be willing to listen and talk a little bit more and also understand that, you know, one of the things that universities used to do really well is before we would call them to a city, we would, we would try to show up about a week or two early, do workshops and actually build relationships with the communities around so that those communities would then come to the theater, right? And then you have a diverse house, right? And then it's actually like an interesting house. You're not just playing in one community. Um, and so I think there needs to be education on both sides and just in terms of building audience. And going back to the question earlier about is there an appetite for political theater? My question to the person asking is like, have they truly been listening to the cries, right? Because I under, again, I understand the, like I'm done, I'm, I don't wanna hear any more of this. But my question is, are you truly listening? Mm. Because, because you can be tired of hearing it but what have you gotten from it, right? And so mm -hmm. if we're kicking and we're screaming louder than we ever have and, and like, you need to listen, you know? And, and we, need to we all need to listen and respond. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know, I can go on for days and days on that, but. <laughs> <laughs> How has the, um, in the aftermath of the festival and all the submissions you watch, and I, I'm sure all the, you know, spectacular you know things that you watched how is that uh, at post festival now and everything that you went through how has that informed you like what because you know we i know after each one of these talks every week mm -hmm. we leave with something more you know what i mean like we leave like it, every one of these talks just builds because we hear something else so we think about something else and we have a conversation where something else is brought to light after this festival how has it moved you or what is what has informed you more after dealing with this festival this past weekend i think it's confirmed for me some of what i already knew how talented and how 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 um, you know how talented we are as a people right and like how much of our voice um is is needs to be heard and 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 how much work we're putting in to actually have a voice and to share our voice, right? The work is there, the work is out there. The artists are out there, right? Um, and so it's just kind of, re, uh, you know, confirmed that for me and, and made me feel like I'm on the right path. But also I think it's, um, I feel like I've gotten more community now like we've gained, we all, I think all through this process, the, the curators, the actors, the, the, you know, the, the artistic directors, I think we, we have built a sense of, or starting to build a sense of community. Um, and if we can continue to build on that and support one another and listen to each other and, and uh, work together, I think, I think we can do some amazing work. Um, but it's not about finger pointing. It's not about blame games. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we've, we've, we've all done that already. Now, like, how, do we, how do we move the needle forward, right? How do we move the needle forward? And hold people accountable, you know, for things that hold, hold holding uh, uh, theater houses accountable for the work they say they want to do. Right, yeah. That's a big part that I think we stress here every week. Um, you know, and, and I think we do it not only with theater, I think we do it with, you know, every industry, you know what I mean? We look at, you know, you look in, you look at the statements that Amazon made, they were great, but then you look at Amazon workers who are like, oh, that's what they said, but let me tell you what's happening at work. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like that accountability part, you know, like I always say, I always say, I'm like, hey, I didn't tell you to make the statement. I didn't ask you to make the statement, but right. you did. You I did. didn't tell you to. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, that that accountability. And also speaking of accountability, what's you know, what's the accountability on our part? Like yeah. what's the accountability on our part as the as the the performers, the artists, the workers? What's our accountability moving forward, you know, hopefully in changing this paradigm? I think and this is this is a hard one because if you're a working performer, actor, writer, and you get a, you get an opportunity to make some money off of your craft. That's a beautiful thing, and obviously you want to take advantage of that. You don't want to turn that down because we know how few and far in between those can be, especially you know black and brown artists. But I think we have to be careful to speak honestly about things that you know we're confronted with that aren't that don't 
don't have our best interests at heart, right? Or, 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 or misrepresent pushing us in a direction where make this character angrier, right? I think we have, a, I think we do have a responsibility to stand up to that. Um, I know it's not gonna always, I know it's not always easy, you know? I, I come from, I, my background is fortunate because I, I've, I've worked with the company for 25 years and we've kind of dictated how we move through the, through this universe uh, called American theater. But uh, yeah, I just think we have to be careful to, you know, and, and that's where these uh, partnerships and, and community building, different organizations coming together and supporting artists and advocating for artists. I think that that's where the importance that will play will come in because if something shady goes down, they'll have someone to go to maybe beside the union and say, hey, you know what, this was happening, can you, can you help me with this? You know, then maybe they have some support. So it's, again, it's having the support system in place so that when things go down, you feel like you're supported and you feel like you're not out there on your own. So if I turn down a role or I push back against the director, you know, or an AD who's saying, I want you to do this with this character. I'm like, nah, I'm not gonna go there. And I end up losing the gig or something crazy happens. Then I, I know I have a resource to go to, to say, you know what, can, let's, can you help me with this? Yeah. What, um, and anybody who, everybody out there listening, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and drop them in the chat right about now. Um, I was gonna say, I know, cause Jamal's got a, a little boy that's gotten a little- I know, I know, we talk, yeah, I, I, I feel you, I feel you. <laughs> he's good, um, he's, been, he's been good, but maybe too good. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too quiet, yeah, when they get too quiet, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we don't want to keep you too much longer, but where, what's, what's moving forward from here? Festival's done. It's by all means been a success. Um, people are going to go back and watch, you know, rewatch, watch if they haven't been able to watch. Uh, where do you go from here? What's next? Where, how does, how does this, how does this phase continue into the next phase? Yeah. So the next phase, the next plan phase is to go into some kind of live production, right? But obviously we're still at odds with that because of the coronavirus. So um, so next initial phase is raising funds for that so that when that time is, you know, opportunity is available, we'll be able to do that. Uh, continue to work with the artistic directors of these theaters to, to continue to build those relationships, to identify artists who were in the festival that they may want to work with. So that, again, all looking for toward live production. And in between that time, uh, the plan is to reach out to artistic directors and see uh, if we can put together these national uh, town hall meetings. So that's, that's the, I think that's the next immediate step. All right, that sounds like a plan. And then pay um, the artists. The artists are supposed to get paid, gotta get paid, so we're gonna pay them. There you, there you go, <laughs> then there's, there's that part. That's actually the first step. <laughs> <laughs> so, as soon as we get the money right, we'll send out to everyone who's supposed to get it. <laughs> All right, that's right. Well, look, Jamal, um, don't want to keep you too long. Like I said, I understand when they when they too quiet, you gotta go see what's happening. Um, I want to say thank you for joining us tonight on behalf of everybody. Any parting words? Anything you want anybody to know? People want any parting shots at the audience? You want them to know what to go look at, what to do? Any inspirational thought to everybody who's watching? Yeah, please go to the breathproject2020.com. Make yourselves familiar with the organization and, and all of the, uh, the work in the archives. But beyond that, it, I mean, if you're a theater professional and you work in American theater, like just, you know, whether you're an ally or, uh, you know, a person of color, I, uh, let's, let's just, you know, find, find community to work toward the, the, the common goal, right? Of making a more balanced and equitable American theater. We want the theater to look like the country does, not like, you know, certain parts of the country do. And that's that's important, right? Because mm -hmm. that that's what we're that's that's what the goal is, right? Yeah. The goal is not, in my opinion, the goal is not some broad takeover. The goal is equity. The it's goal right. is representation of what's real. We all do live here together. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to accurately represent one another and accurately represent our relationships towards one another. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say like, we're not asking for anything extra, anything additional. We just want to be treated like humans, right? Like, you know, I, I, I've noticed, one thing I've noticed before I go, I've noticed this a lot and it's it's cool. Like I'll go out to a store, I live in a predominantly white area. I live in Marin County, 
All right. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes when I go out to a store or something, I'm the black guy walking in the store. I'm, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've noticed since all of this has happened, people have been extra kind. <laughs> No, for real. Like, yeah, you know, I know. You know, I know. You know, right? Like, you have know, extra kind to let me walk in front of them or hold the door. I'm like, it's really okay. Just go, you know? <laughs> and I appreciate that. I get it. I appreciate that. I understand you. this is your way of looking. At, but we're not actually, look, if you're an asshole, be an asshole to me, be an asshole to her, be an asshole to him. <laughs> Don't treat me like an asshole just because I'm black, right? Just, right. We want to be treated exactly like everyone else. Yeah. That's all we ask for, none extra. <laughs> That's right. Hey, everybody, Jacole just posted in the chat uh, the link to the LA Times article that she was talking about. Um, Jacole, you got anything else for the people? Keep listening. Keep listening, y'all. Jamal, thank you very much, man. We appreciate you. Thank you for the work you're doing. Please keep it up, man. We're going to keep in contact and keep an eye out on everything that's happening. Um, thank I'll, I'll definitely reach back for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And everybody, please make sure you come back. We're going back to back. Come back and join us next Thursday. Same bad time, same bad channel. Hope I can say that. Hope that ain't copyrighted or something. Um, <laughs> <come back. laughs> same rep time, same rep channel. Same rep time, same rep channel. Uh, and our guest will be Kaya Dunn and the wonderful Stephen Busher, who was in the audience tonight. He, yes, he, yes. Uh, he had to duck out early, but they'll be back next week and we'll be uh, tackling this thing from the uh, academic angle. So everybody, oh, please come back and join us. Again, Jamal, thank you very much, thank sir. So Appreciate much. all the work you're doing. I mean, it's such a pleasure meeting y'all. It's a pleasure to meet you I'm and Jacole. I'm to seeing y'all in person. That's what I'm looking forward to. That's what's up, man. <laughs> Come on down to SD. Let's we make some down, dope shit. We're just down the oh, coast. Oh. <laughs> All right. We're <laughs> All right. We'll be talking. Bye-bye. All right, y'all. Good night, everybody. Much love. Good night.